Valerie, and today we're getting into the rustle and bustle. This is part two of my Delilah Briarwood cosplay build series. If you missed part one, it'll be linked in the description or at the end of the video. The first video covered the chemise, the drawers, and the corset. Today we're moving on to the rest of the underpinnings, the bustle pad, and the petticoat. For this costume, we don't need a ton of skirt support, but we need just a little bit to get that early 1890s inspired silhouette we're going for. Starting with the bustle pad, we just want to bump up the waist to hip ratio a little bit. I had a little trouble finding the exact right balance that I wanted here because I could have padded a little bit more to give the illusion of the exaggerated, animated, very tiny waist. But there's something about the shape of that skirt and the balance between that and the top half of the costume that I didn't want to mess with too much. So for the bustle pad, it's just a little bit of a subtle addition of a little bit more curve. For the bustle pad, I downloaded the Black Snail Patterns free PDF from her blog. If you're unfamiliar with the process of matching up and taping together a downloadable pattern, this isn't a bad one to start with, since it's a smaller number of segments. It's also included with her fan skirt pattern, which I probably would have used for this costume if I didn't already have an 1890s skirt pattern I'm used to. Both options are linked in the description. I keep a good supply of black broadcloth on hand for linings and utility projects like this one. I mark the darts on each piece with tracing paper and a tracing wheel. I've run into a lot of people who aren't familiar with this tool, which is a shame because it's inexpensive and by far the easiest way to transfer pattern markings onto fabric. You can find the tool and paper in the notions department of any fabric store. I have spent my whole life pinning darts including these, until I happen to run across the ladder stitch basting method. So, instead of showing me fiddling and cursing to line up pins on the dart lines, I'm putting a link in the description to the Threads Magazine tutorial showing the much easier way. I used a tailor's ham to press the darts and start getting the curved shape of the pad. If you don't have one, you can roll and or fold a towel into the right shape, but if you do any ironing of curved pieces at all, it's totally worth the 15 bucks they typically go for. For the padding, I used a very light quilt batting left over from the knee pads on my Resistance Ray pants. I've been trying to stick with using my scraps and stash whenever I can, or I probably would have bought batting with a little more heft, but this ended up doing the job. On the batting layer, the darts are cut out instead of folded to keep from adding a bump from the extra thickness. The upper part of the pad gets a second layer, so the whole thing will sort of taper down over the hips and into the flow of the skirts. I closed the darts with a cross stitch, also called a catch stitch. This is usually used for blind hemming, but it's also useful for a case like this where I wanted to pull the edges together without overlapping. I didn't get footage during this step, but I pad stitched the two layers of batting to help with the curved shape I wanted. I'm still getting the hang of pad stitching, and this was a good project to practice it on, since it didn't matter much that it was pretty sloppy. I sandwiched the batting between the fabric layers and pinned all around the edges so it all fit together as one shape, then stitched around the edge through all the layers. Then the edge was bound with wide double fold bias tape. It's easier to stop stitching before folding each mitered corner of the binding. 
Once the binding was done, I ran a few rows of stitching straight across the bottom edge to help keep all the layers in place. The grommets also help keep the layers in place and provide ventilation so it will trap a little less body heat. Finally, I stitch twill tape ties to the corners and the bustle pad is done. And then over that goes the petticoat, which is not a hoop or a bustle or anything substantially supported like that. It's just a simple taffeta petticoat. There are so, so many examples of very, very fancy petticoats from the 1890s, and I was really tempted to make something like that go all out with the, the pin tucks and the insertion lace and the... It's just not Delilah. Or that's what I told myself to save myself some work because I knew there was gonna be a lot of work with the piecing a little bit down the line. We'll get there. I made the decision to just make a simple taffeta petticoat with one ruffle at the bottom. I thought about going with a silk taffeta because there are so many silk petticoats from the period. It would be fun to have one, but A, this is a cosplay. It needs to survive lots of time on the con floor in various temperatures. It, it needs to stand up to a little bit of wear and tear. But one of the choices I made to make it a little bit more durable was to go with a polyester taffeta. Generally those are a little bit thicker, the modern ones, and I decided to go with an iridescent taffeta which mimics the look of a shot silk where the warp is one color and the weft is another. I have a long-standing personal history with iridescent taffeta that goes back to... God, that I wrote that! I wrote it! It's off the fucking place! That noisy blue dress from a production of Much Ado About Nothing in 1995 is legendary among the people who were involved, including one at the time student intern who is now a quite successful playwright who in her play about Louisa May Alcott immortalized the noisy blue dress in dialogue much to my delight. I mean Delilah doesn't exactly need to stealth and the rustle of petticoats is just that wonderful you know kind of romantic cliche and but I just like how it looks. So that's what we chose for Delilah. When I started, I still thought I might get a little fancy with lace and tool, but this turns out to be the last you'll see of them. My go-to basic 1890s skirt and petticoat pattern is Butterick 3418, which is out of print. But if you search 1890s petticoat pattern, you'll find lots of options that will work just as well. I cut the main pieces for view C or D. I skipped the ruffle pieces since I wanted to add just one longer ruffle. I did all the vertical seams as French seams. If you watched part one, this process will be very familiar to you by now. The back opening is hemmed with the edges turned under twice. Then I stitched back and forth a couple of times to reinforce the point just below where the opening starts. For the waistband, I measured over my corset just below the waist. This will keep it from adding bulk at the actual waist. I added two inches to that measurement for the length to cut the waistband and cut four inch wide strips of that length out of both the taffeta and the broadcloth and basted them together. I used the zigzag gathering method again for the top edge of the skirt, then pinned it to one edge of the waistband at regular intervals, leaving half an inch free at one end for the end seam and an inch and a half at the other end for the tab. I've recently heard this referred to as the divide and conquer method. I love that and will definitely call it that from now on. Then it's easy to distribute the gathers evenly when I pull the gathering thread, especially because there's not a huge amount of fullness to gather in this case. 
I stitched that to the waistband, making sure the gather stayed even as I went. Then I pulled out the gathering thread and wound it back on the spool to reuse. I promise I did press the other edge of the waistband toward the wrong side before stitching the ends with the right sides together. Then I turned it right side out and did a stitch in the ditch to secure the other edge. I could have just top stitched it since it won't be seen, but as you can see, I could use the stitch in the ditch practice. I always seem to end up with a bit of a seam mismatch at the bottom no matter how carefully I cut, so I had to even that up. I've used this pattern a lot, so I knew I didn't need to make any other length adjustments overall. To make the hem binding, I measured the bottom edge all the way around and cut out enough strips of broadcloth on the bias to make that length. I wanted to add a little more structure than usual, so I cut the bias strips a full four inches wide. Once they were joined together in one long strip, I pressed under a quarter inch on one edge. Then I pinned the strip at the bottom edge. Sharp eyes may notice that you see me here pinning it to the inside of the petticoat. I actually started sewing it that way before I noticed. I stitched it all the way around the bottom edge on the outside of the petticoat, leaving a few inches free on either side of the back seam. I trimmed the excess from the ends and joined them carefully at an angle so the binding could lie as flat as possible. Then I pressed the joining seam, even if you don't see me pressing my seams, I pressed my seams, and stitched that last section to the bottom edge of the petticoat. I turned the binding up toward the inside and pressed the hem. Then I pinned the top edge of the binding and stitched it in place. Normally, I stitch this by hand so it's basically invisible from the outside, but in this case, it's going to be hidden behind the ruffle anyway. Press and press again. A binding this wide won't sit quite perfectly flat, but it's close enough for the underside of a petticoat. For the ruffle, I cut enough 14 inch wide strips to make about twice the circumference of the petticoat. Once they were joined, I made a narrow hem on both long edges and used my ruffler foot to ruffle the top edge. The foot can be set to push a pleat under every one, three, or six stitches, depending on how much fullness you want. I pinned the ruffle to the petticoat, lining up the bottom hems, and stitched it down. The same as on the hem binding, I left a few inches free at each end and joined them at an angle to accommodate the flare of the petticoat. Finally, I top stitched black satin ribbon over the ruffle for just a little decoration. So there you have it. We have our bustle, we have our rustle, and next time we're ready to move on to the parts of the costume people actually see. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you'll join me when I come back. Again, it'll be an indeterminate number of weeks. I have a couple of events going on in between and some other stuff that I need to get done. This is my hobby, but hopefully I'll get back to you soon with the parts of the costume that you might recognize. And until then, bye-bye.